Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Complete Sports Media's podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Campbell. And of course, joining me on a nice sunny Monday, Jason Cameron. Uh, man, the weather's been so great. It sure makes you feel good when it's an uh, extended stretch like this right through the weekend. I was able to get out and about. I played some golf. I got uh, lots of uh, eating out all uh, in. Got to sit on patios and things like that. It was just a a great weekend. It makes me feel so much better when it's good like this. Yeah, man, it was it was an exceptional weekend. Like I I had I had a fantastic weekend actually. I really did because I had a friend fly in from Calgary unexpectedly. Uh, well, I shouldn't say unexpectedly. It was actually planned. But he came in from Calgary, saw some friends that I've grown up with for the bulk of my life from high school. Wow. They all came in. We all watched um, uh, the Canucks play. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't gift us with a win, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but we were we got together. And the funniest thing, like as we were talking and stuff and we were catching up, we we're like, when was the last time we did this? Pre-COVID. Oh wow! And it's, and it's funny how we actually always have to put that that moniker on it of right. Oh yeah, yeah pre or post right? Like it's like, yeah. but that, it was literally like that. It's pre COVID, so it was like over four years. So I was like, wow, too long. But I'm glad we. I, I was just happy that we were able to get together. It was always, yeah, it was it's always nice getting together with friends, and it makes me feel good. Yeah, I went to golfing with a couple of buddies and a friend of a friend, and <laughs> um, yeah, it was just nice to be able to get out there, hit the course, uh, you know, ha- enjoy the day. And then we went for some beers and some food after. And yeah, it was just uh, necessary. And it's harder and harder to do it these days. A lot of people got families. A lot of people got lots of work commitments and people move all over. And yeah, so when you uh, make the effort, make it happen, it's, uh, yeah, to me, it's really special. I got a chance to see my dad as well. On Friday, he drove into Richmond. We had a great dinner. Um, absolutely awesome way to start the weekend. And um, I didn't partake in the um, St. Patty's Day like I normally do. Uh, what about you? Did you uh, do some St. Patty's partying at all? No, man, not not really. Like, like, um, yeah, not really at all. Like, the only thing that we did was we got together before uh, the game. We went, We had a nice uh, dinner at the keg at Yeltown. Nice. And so that was really nice. And But that was pretty much about it, man. Like, nice. We had a couple of drinks after. Well, I'm glad you got to the Canucks game. Um, yeah, they didn't uh, play amazing on Saturday night. They got an early goal right away, and you thought, <laughs> okay, this is a, a good beginning. Uh, this, is, this bodes well for a great game. And then that was it. They didn't score again. Um, you got to see Ovechkin score as he's trying to chase down Wayne Gretzky, which it doesn't seem like anymore to me that he's going to do it. Um, you know, you and I just briefly mentioned before we started, uh, the guy's looking like he puts on some LBs and not really keeping in shape like he uh, should. And uh, yeah, it's making them slower. And I think it's going to make it tough to, ch- to chase down this Wayne Gretzky goal scoring record. He had a chance, actually, at the end of the game, I'm I'm pretty sure it was him anyways, to have a breakaway on an open net. And it just looked like he just blew a tire, like, right away, like, as soon as he started to skate. I'm like, what happened to you? Like, it's like, it's almost like he's he's playing the game. He's in a, he's a professional athlete, so to speak, but he's retired at the same time. Like, it's just like, yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, he's yeah. just going through the motions. Yeah, it's tough to see uh, such a great uh, athlete of our time, you know, put in this amazing career and then go out this way. Uh, I I hope he adopts a better uh, diet uh, over the over the off season and he uh, improves uh, his health because yeah, I mean, I think he has a legitimate shot if he if he can score, you know, close to what he did over the last few years uh you know he has a shot to break this record and it would be pretty iconic but um you know from what i've seen this season it's not really uh giving me a lot of hope that he's he's gonna pull this off nah man he he needs to take his nutrition and his his fitness a little bit more serious if he actually wants to do it like if if he's serious about doing it if he like he can literally do it next year 
if he was actually in shape. I believe that, but I don't, I don't, I don't see that. Yeah, too bad. Yeah, well, uh, speaking of the Canucks, um, they're they're still in the midst of this nine-game homestand. They're one, one, and one on the first three games. They play uh, Buffalo tomorrow night as they continue this road trip. Um, I mean, as they continue this homestand and inviting lots of teams in. Um, they've they've led a few teams past them. They're now fourth in the uh, overall standings. And they've got three teams in the central division that are all one point behind them. So uh, easily all three three of those teams with a victory can pass them. I'm starting to uh, get a little worried, get a little concerned that uh, maybe they could get caught by some of the teams below them and uh, you know maybe have a really less favorable opening round matchup. And I'm starting to think that maybe I'm not going to put my – energy my time my heart into them and let them break it again because if they broke it one more time i i just think they i can't never give them another chance so i think i'm going to be a little bit cautious uh as they approach the playoffs uh five weeks today is the opening of the playoffs so it's coming fast and furious but um you know what i've seen from them lately <laughs> i'm thinking i i'm really going to be cautious about this so you want to be cautiously optimistic. Yeah. That, you know what? That That's kind of how the Canucks have trained us as fans. Yeah. To be cautiously optimistic because we're kind of always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Where it's like, yeah, they're good, but, you know, where's the 10-game losing streak? Where, where is, where's that at? Is it coming? But luckily that hasn't happened this year. They're very good. But we're in a division where you got a lot of other very good teams in, yeah. in, in our division. So we have to keep the foot on the metal, you know? Yeah, they sure do. And they have to. And yeah, hopefully they'll be able to have a great uh, rest of the week. They play Buffalo. They play Montreal. They got some games coming up. Uh, hopefully talk, it can uh, instill in them uh, what they have to do. Um, he's, he's a long time playoff veteran. He knows what it takes and hopefully he can instill it in these guys uh, that don't have much playoff experience. So we'll see how it goes. Um, the other uh, big Canadian team that's uh, really blown a lot of people away is the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, they had a huge 6-1 win yesterday, and uh, they're really dominating. Uh, they just ended up taking over first place again. They had a g few games in hand against Colorado and Dallas, and now they've um, been able to jump up to first place again. Uh, they got one of the best goalies in hockey, firing on all cylinders, but the best division in hockey to me is the central division with all those three, three teams battling it out. I think whoever finishes first has a really good shot at going far. Those, those second and third teams are going to have to battle each other. And that's going to be a really crazy opening round of the playoffs. So um, yeah, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone's going to keep their eye on that division as it keeps winding down. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and as I look, even the Predators are one game away from 40 wins. Yeah. Like like that that's yeah. that's a, that is a very competitive division. Pretty incredible, yeah. Um they have they they have GM meetings down in Palm Beach this week and they're doing a, they're they're talking about a lot of things. They're talking about some rule changes. They're talking about more coaches challenges, getting uh things right. Um, they they uh, they have a lot of um, philosophies and things they want to change. Uh, one of the things that they want to outlaw from the game is the emergency backup goalie. And I hope they don't because uh, we've been able to see a Zamboni driver suit up. We've been able to see guys pulled out from the University of UBC. We've been able to see a you know, few guys that just come from the scrap heap and get a chance. And I love that. I hope they don't. Uh, ban it, outlaw it altogether. I think it adds kind of a cool element to the game. It does because it's a wild card, and it's just a, it's just an opportunity for like a normal guy just to be like, "All right, I'm suiting up and I'm going in." Yeah. But okay, here's a question though: if they if they do get rid of that, then do they like what happens? Like, well, that, what I, happens? I, I suppose what they're what they're proposing is they're having um, a professional goalie. Uh, always um, there 
at every game. Uh, I guess they'll pay him sort of a, a like a minor league salary type of a thing, but they'll always have a, a third uh -huh. guy. He'll be in the stands, I guess, or in the press box. And, uh, you know, if, if you know, by, by chance one of the goalies goes down, he can suit up and at least be the backup. And if Bowles went down, he would be in there. But it wouldn't be just some guy that they pull out of the crowd or, <laughs> you know, it just it would be actually a pro guy that's got a contract. Okay, well, for professionalism's sake, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, those guys get together every year. They usually play a lot of golf. There's a lot of uh, interesting talks and conversations. Uh, we'll see what comes out of it. They're talking about a lot of uh, rule changes, and uh, I guess, yeah, we'll see. The game's, uh, the game's in really good shape right now, so hopefully they don't, they don't tweak it too badly and and mess it up at all um i i'm actually uh thinking the nhl is doing a great job right now and and things are good uh one of the biggest games on the weekend was the oilers versus colorado and at the same time you were at the canucks capitals game that game was going on in edmonton and man the difference was just shocking it was like it was like the canucks and the capitals were playing uh, shinny out in the backyard on a frozen rink and the Oilers and, and the uh, Avalanche were playing uh, with jet packs on their back. Uh, the speed was incredible. The game was fun. One of the best games I've seen in years. And uh, it ended with less than a second left in overtime. Colorado scored the game winning goal three, two. And uh, man, it was super entertaining. And those two uh, are on another collision course. Um, good chance that they could play each other in the playoffs. And uh, that would be just super exciting hockey. hockey. Mc McKinnon against McDavid and all the supporting cr cast and crew uh, it would be a phenomenal series. And that game was spectacular. Oh, that, that's, that, that game actually sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. But it would be even more awesome if they were to play like that as a series in the playoffs. Yeah. That would be spectacular. Seven, seven game series would be amazing, yeah. yeah. Um, kind of sad news today, a little bit. Uh Wayne Simmons announced his retirement today. He signed a one-day contract with the Philadelphia Flyers and uh called it a career. Uh 15 years in the NHL, eight seasons in Philadelphia. He scored 203 of his 263 goals in Philly. He ended up playing for six teams all together. Um, really, really top phenomenal player for many, many years. And uh, uh, one of the top instrumental guys in that diversity alliance. And uh, he plans to be part of that moving forward and on into the future. And uh, we wish him an incredible retirement. Finished with 263 goals, 526 points in 1,000 and 37 games um great 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 talented player and uh a guy that you would just love to have in the playoffs i'm really surprised somebody didn't pick him up heading into the playoffs but um he's uh he wasn't picked up so he said calling it a career yeah and it was a great career at that and uh he's got a legacy that he gets to build upon when he was a part of this diversity alliance yeah. and now that begins to be something that he's going to continue to grow along with all the other players and ex-players. It's awesome to see. Yeah. It's great that he's still working on that. And uh, I think he's really going to enjoy his retirement. Yeah. He pers uh, persevered over a lot of uh, racism and a lot of troubles in his earlier years. And I'm uh, really mm -hmm. glad that he was able to just um, put that in his past and just continue on to forge a long 15 year career. And, um, yeah, one of the great guys in the game. Going to be sorely missed, but I think one of the networks will pick him up. He'll be a great analyst and, and a great guy to comment uh, on the future of the sport. It'll be uh, awesome to hear him commentate, too. Yeah, because I've heard him speak. He speaks very well. So, yeah, if, 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 uh, if, I, if I'm a broadcaster, I would definitely want him as an analyst. Yeah. Um. 
Speaking of hockey, uh, I went and saw our Langley uh, Eagles over the weekend. Uh, they started the Provincials on Saturday. Uh, Saturday, they ended up playing a team from West Kootenai, and they outshot them 67 to 16. They beat them four to nothing. Uh, the goalie for West Kootenai was uh, incredible. Uh, this kid's name is Bubba Collins, and uh, he made 63 saves, His keep his team in it. Uh, they could have easily lost 10, 12, 13, 14, nothing. Uh, it was unbelievable. The shots that beat him were all spectacular, incredible shots, and uh, Kootenai would have been severely embarrassed if uh, this kid wasn't in the net, but great to see Langley get an opening win in their first game. It was a lot of fun. It was uh it's all being held over on the North Shore Winter Club, and uh, great to see all the teams come in from all over the province. Oh, no, that's – first off, that's excellent that your team just utterly decimated, dominated the other team, but not as much as they thought they would have because they came up against a very hot goalie. <laughs> like that, That's amazing, actually. That's yeah, amazing. he was amazing. It was impressive. We were cheering for 70. We were on at 70 shots. They were had they had 65 shots with five minutes left, and I thought, oh, they're going to do it. They end up getting a power play, and I thought, okay, well, this is easy now. They'll get three or four shots on this power play, and they got held uh, shotless on that on that two minute power play, and they ended up with 67. I guess uh, not bad. Uh, they ended up playing a game today, and they had a uh, a one one tie against Comox from the island. Uh, they put up another 54 shots today on goal and uh, could only pop one by the Comox keeper. Um, so uh, win in their first game, a tie in their second game. If they can win tomorrow, they're through. If they tie, uh, it, it's about a 50-50 chance if they go through or not. If they lose, I think that's it. They're done. So um, good luck to the Langley Eagles. Um, Nathan Rosenberg didn't play, wasn't needed, but, uh, let's hope this team keeps it up and, um, gets a really great, uh, amount of shots tomorrow, pop in a few more and, uh, continue on with the provincials. Um, they will play, I guess, uh, at least one game, possibly two on Wednesday, if they can go through tomorrow with a victory. If they can keep up the average number of shots that they've had over the last two games, yeah, they shouldn't have a problem winning that next. Yeah, yeah, sure. it's yeah, it's been impressive. Uh, awesome to see them. Uh, yeah, just blasting away, <laughs> blasting away, and uh, yeah, I uh, I'm really hoping. Uh, I'll give you guys an update. I'll get an update sometime tomorrow. They're playing um, early tomorrow afternoon, I think it is, and uh, I'll give you guys an update on the website. Okay, um, I was up at our big set today um, up in Minotti Bay. And uh, they were doing a really amazing stunt scene with a bunch of um, stunt actors. And I got to see uh, one of our friends, Trevor Jones, on set. Uh, he was one of the actors there. And another um, guy that I know from the Lower Mainland here, uh, longtime actor, former fighter, Paul the Mauler Lazenby, uh, saw those guys on set today, and uh, it looked like an amazing scene that they were re rehearsing and choreographing. Uh, I think they're um, they're in Alberta all week. I think they're yeah, well, six days of shooting in Alberta, and then they come back up here after that. So um, they were getting ready for this big scene, but it was cool to see Trevor, and um, yeah, it'll be uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to uh, have him on another podcast again. Uh, I asked him uh, how he enjoyed the strike, and he said, oh, man, it felt like retirement. I was loving it. Uh, I, I really uh, wouldn't mind being retired, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of now know how it feels. So it was kind of cool to, um, yeah, to see those guys today. No, no that's cool. That's cool that uh, those guys were there, but it's actually better to see them working. Yeah. Because, like, again, it just reinforces the fact that we're back to work and things are getting back to normal. Yeah, that was nice. Very nice. Um, 
Uh, the, another funny thing that happened from work was uh, they gave us uh, crew gifts. They all gave us some monogrammed gloves that say The Last of Us on there. And uh, somebody ended up taking a pair and putting them all up online for sale. And uh, so uh, they were trying to do an investigation on find out who was doing that. And who would be stupid enough to do that? I don't really know. Like, you know, I don't know how much you're going to get for a pair of gloves, but could it be a hundred? Could it be a few hundred? Like, I mean, you know, one day's wages, like, you know, are you risking, you know, your job over trying to sell a, a pair of these, these gloves? It just seemed insane to me. Why wouldn't you wait? Right? Like, you know. wait, just, just, if you want to sell the stuff, if you want to do that, wait till the season is done. Like it's air. Yeah. So then go for it. Go for Fill it. Your food. Yeah. Nobody will care after that. Yeah. But if you're gonna try to sell it now, see that didn't come out yet. You can't, yeah. you can't do that. You can't do that, man. Pretty crazy. Yeah, I was shocked. I was. It was. It was mind blowing to hear that. So uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know what what their plan was. But yeah, I think. Um, yeah, if you feel like doing that, I, I don't think I'd ever do that in oh. a million years. But you know, I guess. Yeah, why not? Why not wait? Yeah, exactly. And also too, like for myself. It's just a lot of work for a pair of gloves. I'm not doing it. Like, no. like I, I know what we get for swag. You know what we get for swag. It's like, no, nah, man, just, I'm not going to get a lot for this. I don't, I don't care. Yeah, I, I don't care. Yeah, do not care, yeah. <laughs> um, did you get to see a lot of NBA over the weekend? Did you get to see much? <laughs> Unfortunately, not as much as I would have liked. No, so I didn't, I didn't get to see it too much. The uh, the big game on the weekend for me was the game between the Warriors and the Lakers. And uh, it was a battle of the old, old, old guys. It was uh, kind of crazy to see um, old LeBron, old Steph, old Draymond, all these old guys out there. Uh, they ended up having this crazy finish. The yeah. last, the last two minutes ended up taking about twenty five minutes to finish because yeah. the shot clock would not go and wouldn't work. So they they kept inbounding the ball and then they would try to do something and then they would go. We it, it's not going yet. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, it looks like it's gonna go. All right, inbound it again and and LeBron finally came over with the ball after like second or third time. And he's like, I'm too old for this, guys. I'm too friggin' old for this. And and Steph ended up saying that after the game. He goes, you know, you gear up, you're, you know, you're in the mode and uh you cool down, and then you know, you gotta gear up again, and then you cool down and then gear up. Like, we're old men here. What are we what are we doing? That we can't have this happen again. And it ended up uh five separate times they had to stop the game because the shot clock just wouldn't work and they finally had to abandon it and use a stopwatch uh one of the refs did and um it was bizarre it was super strange and weird and uh it just um yeah it just it just ended up creating a crazy crazy long 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 drawn out finish yeah i i saw that on instagram i i saw that it was extended by like 60 minutes and then you you saw the celebrities in, in the front row and they're just like looking on their phones and stuff and i'm like what, what, what's going on here? And it's just like, it just ruined the flow of the game. Yeah. Like it, it, it annihilated the flow of the game. Yeah. So hopefully going forward, they actually have a contingency plan and actually every NBA arena should have one just in case because nobody wants to see that shit again. No. Nobody wants to see that shit again. No, no. That was, it was bad. Uh, so Mr. Glass, not one of the old guys, but, uh, Mr. Glass, Anthony Davis, uh, ended up getting a boo-boo and having to leave, uh, in the first quarter. Uh, so LeBron had to take over. LeBron scored 40 points. He became the third oldest player in NBA history to get 40 point in, in a game. And, uh, just another sort of notch on the, uh, resume and the, the list of accolades he's got. Um, but, uh, he was using his walker late in the game, and he uh, actually had the walker kind of step uh, on the sideline. He hit a three-pointer, and then they counted it, and then they 
did a replay uh, on another play, and they realized, oh no, him and his walker stepped out of bounds, and uh, they discounted the three. And then after they kept trying to inbound the ball to him over and over and over, I think he just got tired and and just threw the ball away. And uh, his 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 misplay in the corner, uh, stepping on the sideline, and his turnover ended up costing the Lakers the the victory. The Warriors were able to pull out a win, but um, the good thing is the Warriors sit in ninth, the Lakers sit in tenth, and it's really good chance that these teams will play in that play-in game. They have one more regular season game left against each other April 9th, and then that play-in game is looming large. It kind of looks like those two teams are going to be 9-10 in the uh, Western Conference. Well, the last time they played a play-in game, those two teams, it was epic. It was an absolutely fantastic game. So, cool. I'm yeah. all for it. Yeah. That, that works for me. Let's I, do it again. Let I it don't back. mind it. Yeah, no, it, it would work for me, too. Um, it was uh, – Steph had a good game, scored another 31 points. And, um, yeah, it, uh, it was a fun game, but uh, really that <clears throat> craziness at the end just ended up dragging it out. I was, like – trying my best to keep my eyes open because it was late and we had been to a concert. And so uh, I was dying. I'm like, come on guys, get this figured out here. I need to watch the end of that. But yeah, it was nuts. Uh, they are playing. Uh, the Warriors are playing tonight against the Knicks. Kind of one of the marquee games tonight. I'm reporting it right now. Me I've too. got my eye a little bit on it, but I really want to watch it. Um, Jalen Brunson is having an absolutely phenomenal year, and um, he was named one of the players of the week. He was the Western Conference Player of the Week. Um, he was averaging about 36 points a game, five assists, three rebounds, and two steals as the Knicks went 3-0. and Even though they're missing OG Ananobi and Julius Randle and a few other players, um, he's just been phenomenal for them. Hey, he's been awesome. Yeah. He's most certainly going to make possibly not first team all NBA, but I think definitely second team all NBA. Yeah. Like he's been that good. He's been that consistent. And he's the reason why the Knicks are where they're at. Yeah. Over 40 points the last two games. First time in Knicks history that their point guard had 40 points in two straight games. Um, the other NBA player of the week was another Jalen, uh, Jalen Green of the Houston Rockets. He led the Rockets to a 3-0 record, 26.5 points per game, 8 rebounds, 4 assists. And the former number 2 overall pick is really starting to play into his own. Houston's finally got some pieces and, uh, you know, some synergy there. And, um, yeah, it's nice to see a guy start emerging that um, was really lost there, uh, you know, since he's been in Houston. But uh, good to see him have a great week. Yeah, and I, I think what's helping him along on his NBA career is having those vets yeah. to reinforce, like, good habits. Because I think for the longest time, he was just, like, able to do whatever he wanted. And now they're just like, yeah, yeah, you know what? That doesn't work. That's not winning basketball. Let's not play like that anymore. Yeah. Did you see the Kyrie Irving shot oh. uh, that everyone's talking about? Oh. Uh, what did you think of it? You know what? As much – as I'm not a fan of his off-court antics, if I just compartmentalize the player, he's absolutely sublime. Yeah. He's amazing. When they say he's possibly one of the, the 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 most skilled player to ever play the game, he does stuff like that against the seven foot two Joker. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. I see left hand like baby hook magic shot like I. I don't know what it was, but I'm like looking at it and I go, how did that go in? It was almost like all net. And I'm like, yeah. bloody hell, man. Amazing shot. He's amazing. Yeah, that was uh, absolutely incredible. Um, the good thing about him this year is he's just shut up and played basketball. Uh, yeah. I think he's started 18 games in a row and it's the first time since 2016 that he's yeah. actually played that much basketball in a row. And he's just shut up. He hasn't talked about the world being flat, about how they can't do this, how he can't take shots. He can't 
you know, all the crap that he's created in the past few years has just been shoved to the side and he's just playing basketball and he's amazing. And that shot was just incredible. Uh, you sent me a cool um, Instagram post, though, that showed LeBron doing that years ago when they yes. played together in Cleveland. And yep. uh, I think a lot of people have forgotten about that shot because yep. uh, I didn't see any comparisons other than what you showed me today to that. And LeBron going across the middle on the top of the paint and, and hitting that yeah. left-hand crazy shot. Yeah, man. And so at, as much as they 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 – they were teammates, but Kyrie wanted to do his own thing. It's kind of funny how art imitates life. Yeah. And he imitated LeBron there. He did it in the game, but Kyrie did that for the win. And yeah. so I I he's he's absolutely incredible to watch yeah. when he when he's on the court. And I'm just I'm happy that he's 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 healthy and he's helping his team. And and the fact that it not all of the, the stress is on him because He's got the other guy yeah. that's just, like, better, more incredible. Yeah. Because it's almost like now they can look at each other and be like, okay, so that was a good game winner. Luca's like, now watch what I do. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it's pretty amazing that Kyrie is the second option there. And, you know, an amazing second option for you. Um, it says here, I've got a post that says here, his game winner on Sunday afternoon is the longest game winning hook shot ever recorded. Uh, it's it was 21 feet out. Um, it's just the 11th record. Uh, it's 11th hook shot in league history from at least 20 feet out, and the only one to ever win a game. So um, pretty wild that he's uh, been able to enter the record books. And uh, they say the NBA began tracking shot-specific data in 1996. So there's no way to officially track shots before that season. But yeah. his buzzer beater is the longest game-winning hook shot in at least 28 years and probably much longer than that. Uh, the hook shot is kind of gone by the way of the dodo. We remember Kareem perfecting yeah. it and a lot of big men utilizing it, but... It's not used very much anymore. And, and until you sent me that LeBron stuff, I hadn't seen a shot coming across the middle like that. And, you know, with a, like you say, a seven footer stretching his arm out to try to block it. He, he didn't have any other options, but to let it go with his left hand like that, like how he did it. And it was, it was kind of weird too. Cause it wasn't like a traditional type of hook shot. It was almost no. just like a, you know, throw it up into there and get it, yeah. make it happen. Like, like it was like it was like a shot put. Like I, I don't know, man. Like yeah. I, I watched it so many times. And I'm like, how did he do that? Like that's what my brain kept saying as I watched him, watched him put that ball in the net. I'm like, how the heck did he do that? Yeah. And that's what he does. He does amazing stuff. And I'm just glad he's just doing amazing stuff without all the other stuff. Love it. Yeah. Super happy. Um. Duncan Robinson yesterday set an NBA record. He hit a three-pointer yesterday, become the fastest player ever to get a thousand three-pointers. He did it in his 343rd game. Um, pretty amazing, kind of under the radar. Uh, you know, a prolific shooter, but you're not thinking that he's, you know, done it faster than Clay, done it faster than Steph, done it faster than, you know, Ray Allen, uh, Reggie Miller, all the you know, top guys, uh, but the fastest ever to get a thousand threes is Duncan Robinson. That's impressive. Yeah. That's actually very, very impressive. Because now, if you take that into consideration, he he could he has the potential to track down whoever's in front of him. Yeah. That's including Steph. Yeah. Because of how fast he did it. And because in this age of like we run and gun three pointers. That's he, he could catch him at the end of his career. He could catch them. Um uh Milwaukee um uh, ended up setting a uh or tied a NBA record yesterday with 18 three pointers in the first half. Um Giannis ended up having some hamstring soreness in the 
warm up to the game. They scratched him. Uh, so Dame had to step up. Dame had 31 points, 16 assists. That ended up setting a franchise record for Milwaukee. And then Bobby Portis came in and just started draining three pointers. He hit five in the first quarter, ended up having a phenomenal game. And um, 25 first half points for Portis. And uh, they ended up uh, getting a huge win, Milwaukee. And uh, Giannis wasn't needed. Yeah, and that's that's impressive that Giannis wasn't needed because most nights you do need that guy. But that's another reason why they got Dame in there yeah. because he should be able to carry the offensive load, and that's exactly what he did. I watched Victor Wembanyama yesterday. Wow, incredible. The guy is just amazing. He's, he's just – I've blown away Chet Holmgren now for the rookie of the year. I think it's a one-man race now. Uh, yesterday's line was 33 points, 15 rebounds, seven blocks, and seven assists. Uh, just uh, incredible stat line that's just mind-blowing. And, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I just – every single game, he does two, three, four things that just blow me away and – uh I just can't wait for this guy's career to just keep going and rolling and rolling. Yeah, man, because it's he, he has that uniqueness of his physique, right? Yeah. But the fact that, you know, he gives a shit and he tries and he yeah. plays hard, yells at his teammates. Like, that's who you want to see as the face of your league. That's who you want to see as your next bona fide superstar. I believe he's definitely in the running for defensive player this year. Yeah. How, how yeah. could he not? Yeah. Like, no despite, despite despite the Spurs record, man, he's amazing. Incredible block machine, and just yeah, he is amazing. It's uh, super fun to watch. Uh, hopefully, the Spurs can keep uh, getting better and better and better, and uh, surround him with some some amazing talent. And uh, yeah, the sky's the the limit for him. Um, <laughs> Boston continues to roll along. They got a ten game lead on Milwaukee and the rest of the conference are far, far, far behind. Uh, they had another victory today. Jalen Brown played, uh, Tatum and Drew Holiday were both injured, so they didn't play, but, uh, Jalen Brown, uh, was good enough and got the victory. Uh, they're just running away with this Eastern conference. And, um, do you think it's going to be hard to keep them motivated, uh, the rest of the season and will they, um, not really go in, uh, you know, being tested uh, into the playoffs, which I think is kind of necessary to sometimes for a team to go into the playoffs, uh, having to, you know, face some stiff competition, but they haven't really in, in a while. No, I, I think they're going to be extremely motivated, to be honest with you, because they've been so close for so, for so long. They're battle tested. They know what's on the line. And I and I have to believe they they got to know that this has been probably this is probably their best roster they've ever had. Yes, sure. they got they got to know that. So they know that this is the year to get it done. Yeah. No excuses. No excuses. This no year. excuses. Yeah. Um, Toronto Raptors. Uh, we get tons of coverage up here with them, but uh, they've just lost their seventh straight game, falling to twenty three and forty five. They lost to Orlando. 111.96 yesterday. It's terrible there. It's bad. It's hard to watch this team play. Uh, I, I feel bad for Raptors fans. I feel bad for the city after winning a title a few years ago. How the mighty have fallen, and um, yeah, it doesn't. It's it doesn't look like it's going to get very good for for quite a while. No, they they need to really work on that team. They need to support the guys that they want to keep, but they they need to add a lot of pieces. Like, like the team is still – they're still restructuring the team to uh, something that's a viable product because it's not right now. It's not right now. Yeah, it's too bad. It's tough. And uh, I feel bad for, yeah, the dedicated basketball fans in this country that live and die by them. Um, yeah, it, it's – they're not fun to watch right now. And they don't – it doesn't look like they'll be fun for a while. So, uh, tough times ahead. Um Okay, let's switch to the NFL. Uh, NFL free agency period is still going. Uh, the biggest stories this weekend were the Steelers kind of went nuts, and they uh, ended up getting Russell Wilson. 
got rid of small hands, pick it out of there. And then they get Justin Fields uh, as their backup quarterback to Russell Wilson. Pretty amazing moves, uh, getting rid of Pickett and saying, okay, now we got Russ and Justin. Russ can come in, be our starter, one or two seasons, maybe one. Justin Fields being the succession plan going forward. Uh, they're only having to pay Russ $1.2 million. Fields makes about 3.4, so not much of a commitment to your two top QBs, and uh, you can start filling in the rest of the roster with a lot of top end talent. Yeah, absolutely, man. Like I, I think it was a smart play on their part because now Russ has to show them something. Yeah. Because if he doesn't show them something, then Fields, you're up, right? And they're and they're they're not married to either player. I, I think each one's under contract for just a year. I think, or something like that. So, so yeah, I think it's well done. Bravo. Because right away, the Pittsburgh Steelers have improved their quarterback position exponentially. Yeah. And uh, they're just that much better. And they're, and they're, a defeat, they're a defensive squad anyways. So whatever the quarterback can give them, they're just that much better off from last year. Yeah. Uh, you've always been one of those dedicated uh, sports fans. So have, have I. And through thick and thin, stay with your team. Uh, I've decided to finally say goodbye to my NFL team. Uh, I've had it. They've pissed me off for the last time. That's it. I am no longer an LA Chargers fan. I'm sorry, but you messed me up. You've broken my heart way too many times. And oh. you just completely just decimated this team. Uh, this team had Justin Herbert in great position with tons of weapons, and you just screwed it up with Brandon Staley. You had uh, Telesco in there as a GM making terrible moves, and then you get rid of those guys, bring in new regime, got Harbaugh, things are looking good, and then you release Mike Williams, and then you tell him, oh, actually, maybe we want to sign you. Sorry about that. We didn't mean to cut you, but uh, no, I, I don't know what we're doing. And then Keenan Allen, uh, let's just get rid of you. Um, who wants him for like a fourth rounder? Oh, uh, okay, yeah, get rid of him. Uh, Austin Eckler, let him walk. And and now Herbert's got nobody on offense to throw to, to hand the ball off to. And now they're going to screw up his entire career here. I just can't stand it anymore. And I'm taking requests from the 31 other NFL teams who wants me to be their fan. I'm on the free agent market. Convince me to be your fan, and I'll be loyal all the way through thick and thin. Uh, but that's it. Chargers have just done it. They're, they've screwed it up, and I'm not willing to give them any more of my time. Okay, the Austin Eckler thing, I thought, okay. Okay, you, you didn't want to pay him, fine. But who are you going to replace him with? Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. Okay, didn't see that coming. That that was the first thing. The second, the, the biggest one, though, you let Keenan Allen go? Like, I I, I was just like, I got to see this again. Am, am, I, am I reading that right? And I'm like, that doesn't even make any sense. Not at all. Not that, that, is, not at all. that is your stud receiver. Yeah. That was your number one dude that has never let you down. <laughs> Literally never let you down. And yeah. you're just like, ah, I, I think we're good. Like, what are you talking about? Like, if I was Keenan Allen, I'm like, what are you talking about? I got traded today. <laughs> I thought I was untouchable. Yeah. I'm sure Herbert was on the phone going, what the hell going on? What the hell are we doing? Wait, what, where's my guy? Yeah. Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, Herbert's just got to be beside himself, super choked. Oh. Uh, You know, they'll probably draft the guy, but, you know, he's not Keenan Allen. And not Keenan, Keenan Allen, Allen, you know, has put together 11 amazing seasons there, over 10,000 yards. Touchdown machine, you know, solid as he come. And, yeah. you know, they just they just let him walk. I heard that they got offered a third round draft pick by Houston and said, no, 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 forget that. And then a day later, traded him for a fourth round draft pick. And, and I'm just like, you got to be effing kidding me. And, uh, you know, after a 5-12 and 12 brutal season last year, uh, you know, I think, okay, you know, Harbaugh's coming in. It's going to really, you know, Turn this thing around and, you know, we're going to see some great strides. And then they just blow everything up, mess this whole thing up. 
and um, yeah, that's it. That's it. I'm I'm sorry, but I I'm just done. I'm done. Um, I'm I'm considering turning to Atlanta. I love Kirk Cousins and what they've done. Uh, I'm considering uh, joining your dark side, and I know they haven't had a massive amount of success in the whole history of their franchise either. But I uh, love Kirk Cousins and uh, love that. Uh, but as I said, I'm taking offers. 31 other teams come at me. I'll be a loyal fan. I'll give you lots of media attention. I'll give you lots and lots and lots of great things. And uh, I'm 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 ready to jump ship. Uh, I I need to be on. Uh, I need to be in an organization and cheer for an organization that that you know un does things smartly and and treats guys right. And this this was just not right. Gives a shit about winning. I don't know. Like. Like, Jesus, I, this can't be a Harbaugh decision. That's the one thing that I saw from the Keenan Allen thing. Yeah. This can't be his decision because he's like, I I kind of need that guy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I need him. Yeah. So what, what are we doing here? Like, that can't be his decision. That has to really come from the owner, the GM, or the owner told the GM, oh, you know, we got to cut some money here. We got to save some like, I Whatever it is. Bro. That they had to do with that was the wrong choice. And that's the wrong guy to let go of. Yeah. Wrong. So I heard uh Williams met with the Steelers today. He's also meeting with the Jets and the Panthers. And then I heard the Chargers were also on the phone trying to get him back. And uh I think he's just gonna, you know, say uh, no oh, chance. Yeah. Uh no, not gonna happen. So uh good on him. Uh they don't deserve you. And uh yeah, uh, I hope you end up having a Hall of Fame career somewhere else and uh, stick it to them. Um, there was a couple of uh, other things that happened today. A big deal signed. Um, Chase Young ended up signing uh, a one-year deal with the Saints, uh, $13 million coming from the 49ers. Uh, Commanders had traded him to the 49ers partway through last year, and now he is a Saint. Uh, decent deal for him, 13 mil. And then the Bills um, signed their nickelback, Taron Johnson, to a three-year contract extension, $31 million. Highest ever money for his position. Uh, the Bills have been decimated this offseason. They uh, cut Tredavious White and Jordan Poyer. And it uh, looks like they're going to lose Micah Hyde to retirement. And so um, Taron was a guy they needed to... Uh, sign and get him solidified in there. Uh, he had a phenomenal year last year, 100 tackles. And um, yeah, really, really, really important piece for them after losing a few big pieces there. Yeah, and that's, that's unfortunate. I guess uh, they were up against the cap or whatever, so they had to let go Poyer because I can't imagine that you'd want to let go of your all-pro safety and just let him walk away. Yeah, just walk away. Yeah, it's like so. Great. Yeah, man, they they got a they got a lot of uh, uh, restructuring to do for their defense. I saw Josh Dobbs uh, signed uh, with the Niners today. Love Josh Dobbs. Uh, we talked about him uh, a bit this off season, so he'll back up Brock Purdy. It looks like there. That's kind of cool. And um, I want to show a posting on uh, X old Twitter um that that happened today let me uh see if i can pull this up and uh show a posting from the dallas cowboys okay come on oh wait, there you go there you go. We're getting ready to turn your card in. I am so pumped with it. Be elite, baby. Every day, every place. Be elite. Leighton Vander Esch ran him down. Bootleg out to the right. Man, is chased and hauled down and throws incomplete. And the Wolf Hunter hunted him down. Look, he throws it over the middle, intercepted by Van Der Esch at the 35. Chased out of the pocket, hit, sack, fumble. Van 
Honduras has it and runs it in. Flushed out, runs, sacked. Van Der Esch is going to get this one. Come on. Yeah, yeah, baby. Every play, man. Let's go. You know what we got to do today? You know what we got to do today? No. Hey, man, at the end of the day, this game's going to come down to who does their job better. Lead on the field. Be calm in the storm. Communicate at the elite level. Fly around and have fun, man. He's running into the middle. Boom! Good ball over the middle. It's intercepted. Van Der Esch coming right. Late Van Der Esch. Oh, nice tackle in the open field. Fourth and three. Wentz blitz. Hit set. Ball's out. And the Cowboys have recovered it. Play to Mixon on the left side. Run down from behind by Van Der Esch. So, Leighton wow. Fresh has called it a career. Dallas uh, put that uh, nice tribute to together for him. Uh, only played six seasons in the NFL. Uh, has had severe neck and back injuries. Uh, yeah. Last year, in week five, uh, Dallas was played in San Francisco. He received a pretty severe neck injury. Never played another down. And it said that his body has let him down. It won't cooperate, and he has to call it a career. Um, amazing linebacker for Dallas, and uh, it's tough to see a guy only be able to get six seasons in before um, injuries uh, force him out of the game. Yeah, he was awesome. He was fantastic. He was great to watch. He was uh, he was a menace on the field, and. It sucks, man. That sucks. Like the, just the injuries that guys in the NFL can accrue over the course of their career, and especially the injuries that he had, because now you're you're putting at risk like your your mobility, like your ability to walk. Period. Yeah. So when it, when it gets to that point, hey, it's your health comes first. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, wish him well. Hope he has a fantastic uh, life uh, after football. But um, yeah, do not want to risk being able to walk, being able to um, you know move. And uh, yeah, uh, when you're messing with your neck and your back, uh, that's time to call it a career. And I'm glad he's he's walking away. And um, hopefully uh, he returns 100 percent to to his health. Um, okay. I just want to mention a couple more things. I want to mention uh, on the weekend, the golf's fifth major happened. It's called the players championship happens at TPC Sawgrass, which happens in uh, Florida and Scotty Scheffler um, world. Number one became the first player ever to win this 50 year old tournament in back to back years. Jack Nicholas didn't do it. Tiger Woods didn't do it. Fred Couples didn't do it. Uh, none of those stars were able to win this tournament in back-to-back -back seasons. He's actually been able to win in back-to-back -back weeks. Uh, he was able to win in Bay Hill. Five-shot win last week. Able to come in here and get the victory. He started the day five shots back. Was able to shoot an eight under 64 and pass everybody else. He finished about three or four holes uh, before everybody else, and everybody started trying to chase him down. He finished at 20 under. Three other guys got to 19 under, and they just couldn't get that one more birdie to put him over the top. And uh, the funny thing was the three guys chasing him, two defending major champions, and Xander Shoffley, uh, number six in the world, uh, you just thought, oh, one of these guys is going to be able to do it. We're going to see a playoff. It kind of looked like maybe even a two, three, four-man playoff. And Scheffler just was playing, uh, hitting balls on the driving range and keeping his eye on things, and and they just couldn't catch him. And uh, he ends up cashing the $4.5 million winner's check after getting $4 million last week, $8.5 million in two weeks. Pretty incredible payday. And uh, he continues to chug along at world number one and and kind of one of the most dominant stretches since we've seen in, in a very long time, kind of reminiscent of Tiger during, uh, you know, certain stretches of his career. Uh, this guy is just playing phenomenal golf and uh, an incredible Sunday to get the win. Yeah, no, absolutely incredible, especially knowing that he was that far behind uh, the leaders and catching them. But I, I love the fact that 
he caught them, surpassed them, and then has to wait to see if he gets chased down himself. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. Yeah, it was pretty wild watching. They just kept cutting to him and him and his caddy talking, him trying to hit a few balls, staying yeah. loose, staying uh, busy, and uh, and they just weren't able to. Uh, Wyndham Clark was probably the guy that had the closest chance. He's the defending U.S. Open champion. Um, he hit a, a putt on 18 that – it, I think I think it started about 12 feet from the hole. He putted it, and it started going towards the hole, and it caught the inside lip, and it started to go down, and then it spun out, and it fell a little bit off the hole. And he 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 saw it, and he saw it going in, and he went to fist pump, and then he stopped. And then he went to fist pump again because it looked like it was going in a second time, and then it didn't, and he's like, oh, my God, no. And he... Finished second place. It was heartbreaking and crazy how close he was to actually getting a chance to go into a playoff. Just wasn't meant to be. <laughs> wasn't meant to be. I, I'm sure. I'm sure the other guy was just like, "Hey, got close, but you know what? That four point five million, that is mine." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, Brian Harmon was the other guy that was chasing him down. Uh, he was. Um, the, he's the defending open champion that they do over in the UK and he, uh, fell one shot short as well. And, um, he's just a little guy, five foot six. So, uh, yeah. you know, short is, is in the conversation every time you see or talk to him, but, uh, phenomenal golfer and, uh, yeah, he still cashes a nice big fat check as well, but, uh, finishes three guys tied for second. Uh, Canadians did pretty well. We had Corey Connors finish in a tie for 13th. He had uh, he got about $350,000 check. Uh, Nick Taylor finished in a tie for 26. He cashed a check for 200 grand, and so did uh, Mackenzie Hughes, also uh, 26th place. Uh, nice to see our Canadians uh, getting up their top 26. Is pretty damn great, and um, yeah, uh, a phenomenal tournament. And amazing to watch. And, uh, yeah, the, the purse is now $25 million. They spread out over all the guys. But uh, Scheffler with the huge $4.5 million. Back-to-back uh, -back weeks, $8.5 million bucks. Like, that is just insane to be able to get that kind of money. Uh, his wife is very pregnant. Looks like, uh, you know, going to have their first kid within the next month or two. And um, pretty Pretty great, uh, you know, to start a family uh, with that kind of money. No, no, it's actually awesome. And I'm sure his wife was very, uh, it, it like, it was a driving force in him winning because it's like, hey, baby's coming. You want, you want, you want to be seen as a winner by the child. You want, to, you want to have that winning feeling? So win. Let's and do also, it. Babies are expensive. Get that money. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, I started trying to see um, how long he has been number one in the world. Uh, mm. 43 weeks. Uh, pretty impressive. Uh, Dustin Johnson is um, the longest at uh, outside of Tiger um, for number one in the world uh, in this sort of day and age. Uh, he was 64 weeks. Uh, Tiger, his longest was 281 weeks. And he also had a stretch of 264 weeks uh, that he broke. Um, actually, uh, Tiger Woods was number one in the world for a little over 13 years of his career. So uh, Scheffler, not even a year, long, <laughs> long, long way to go. Yeah, he, he's, he's got some work to do. He's got a little bit of work to do. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Tiger, um, he ended up being one of the guys that met today with the Saudi Arabian uh, Public Investment Fund, the guys that are funding Live Golf. Uh, they started to uh, ramp up the talk about this merger and uh, the ability for the Saudis to uh, fund the PGA Tour and make this finally happen. Uh, all the way back in June, uh, early part of June, they talked about this merger happening. And uh, they haven't agreed to it. They haven't signed it. There haven't been talks for a really long time. But the PGA Tour uh, directors all met today. Undisclosed location. No media there. Um, but Tiger was there. 
Patrick Cantlay, Jordan Spieth, Adam Scott, Webb Simpson, and Peter Malnati all ended up meeting with those guys. And uh, let's hope this can finally uh, come together and they can have this uh, merge happen and uh, the, the golf world won't be so fractured as it has been the last couple of years. Yeah, that would be great because, like, you know, they, they came out with this, this blockbuster deal that didn't happen. So hopefully something happens from this, like, either way. Either they merge or they don't. But uh, now that they got the important people in the same room, hopefully something comes. Let's hope. Yeah. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Okay. Uh, March Madness starts tomorrow. The uh, first four games uh, are happening tomorrow. We've got a um, game at uh, 340 and one game at 340, the next game at six o'clock, 610. Uh, the two. Number 16 teams that are going in are Wagner against Howard. And then the late game has Colorado State against Virginia. And uh, those are the two 10 seeds. Uh, the following day has Wednesday has Grambling State against Montana State, the early game. And the late game has Colorado against Boise State. And then the regular first round starts 9 15 a.m on thursday and the games are just going to be all day all night uh for a nice long stretch can't wait for march madness uh we've got the four number one seeds are the uh north carolina tar heels uh yukon huskies the purdue boilermakers with chad Eady, the canadian and the houston cougars in the south um all four had phenomenal seasons and they will try to, um, yeah, just continue their great play. And uh, number one seeds, not that often. Number one gets knocked off uh, for a very long time. So we'll see. Um, unfortunately, Purdue did get knocked off last year. But I think Chad Eady and the Boilermakers are going to have a much better turn this year. And uh, let the madness begin. I can't wait. I can't wait for the March Madness to start up. Um, I, I love the fact that there's a heck of a lot more parody and yeah. it's so much harder to pick who's going to make it to the final four, who's going to make it to the elite eight. Like it's, yeah. it's tough, man. It is tough to pick what teams are going to continue to, uh, win in, in March madness. I, I saw like a bracket counter earlier yeah. today and there was already a million brackets in that one. Uh, I think it was the ESPN's um bracket uh mix there and uh yeah there there's gonna be by by wednesday by thursday there's gonna be millions of brackets busted and no, uh, yeah it's the most um yeah it, it's the most unpredictable thing that you could ever imagine and yeah. uh, it's just getting harder and harder to figure it out as the years go by uh, last year was just insane and crazy and uh, I, I expect nothing less for this tournament. And that's what I'm hoping for, because that's the awesomeness of March Madness. It was just the insanity. Yeah. So I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the women's bracket as well. Uh, the four number one seeds are South Carolina, Iowa, USC, and Texas. Um, LSU, the defending champions, are a number three seed. Uh, Tennessee became the only school to be in all 42 Division I Women's Basketball Championships. So the only team that have played in every single solitary one of them starting in 1982. So congratulations to the Lady Vols. And um, that'll be fun to watch. I really look forward to seeing Iowa, seeing South Carolina, seeing those top teams. I, I mentioned uh, last week's broadcast that South Carolina and LSU will have some players suspended from their brawl coming in. So uh, might be ripe for the picking for a big upset there. And that will just absolutely uh, be insane if one of those two get knocked off. That would be. That would be very much insane. But, uh, hey, let the madness continue. Let the madness continue. Yeah. Um, we have some more uh, news from the world of soccer. Uh, Lionel Messi, he's going to miss Argentina's <laughs> upcoming games this Weekend against El Salvador and Costa Rica. We, he has a right 
hamstring injury. Uh, he left last week's game uh, with the with the issue, uh, and then he sat out this Saturday's game against DC United. Um, he's considered week to week, and um, uh, the 36 year old I think is going to be probably week to week a lot of this year. Um, should we put bets on if we're going to see him here in Vancouver in May? Um, I'm leaning towards we're not. Uh, I feel sad for all the people that have shelled out a lot of money already. But um, yeah, I think this is going to be a, a, a season where you and I talk about more games that he doesn't play than the ones that he does. Yeah, I, 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 I've said it already. Like, I, I think it's going to be a big deal. I think they're going to definitely be monitoring the amount of play time that he has uh, since he's an older player, so to speak. And uh, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know if he's going to play here. Yeah. I, I, I would lean towards probably not. Yeah, honest. that's sad, but yeah, probably you're right. Uh, there was a huge match day on Saturday. Uh, out of all the games, there was 47 goals scored, which was fantastic to see. Uh, the Vancouver Whitecaps got a huge 3-1 to one win over Dallas and currently sit second place in the Western Conference, and they've only played three games. The team ahead of them uh, have played four. Uh, they've got the 10 points. Uh, Whitecaps got seven. Uh, nice start and great to be already uh, right near the top of the conference uh, after three games. Yeah, good start to the season. Hopefully they can continue the great starts for the rest of the season. Yeah, Minnesota's uh, ahead of them. Uh, Portland is tied with them. Uh, Portland falls one, uh, back of them into third. LA Galaxy sit fourth. And then uh, the next uh, teams are St. Louis, Sporting Kansas City, Colorado, and Real Salt Lake. Uh, Inter-Miami, as I mentioned, played without Messi. Uh, but Lu Luis Suarez ended up getting two goals in their 3-1 to one win over DC United. Um, yeah, Suarez is going to have to have a phenomenal year in Messi's absence, and so far he's looking phenomenal too. Uh, and uh, amazing one-two punch they have there. And um, yeah, great for Beckham. Uh, did you see Beckham was up here skiing up in Whistler this past weekend with his family? Uh, there was some uh, social media posts and pretty wild to see him uh, in our midst. What's he doing here? Is he running a team? You know what I mean? Like, I, I, hey, I get it. I get it. I guess sometimes family comes first and they're important and stuff. But you got a team that you're doing right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Your star player's not even playing. He's hurt. You should be like, Messi, is there anything I can do for you, man? You want me to rub your feet? Like, what do you need? What do you need from me? <laughs> 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 yeah, I think he's got people a little lower than Beckham to rub his feet. So, uh, yeah, I think he can go skiing with his family. and Others can rub Messi's feet. I don't know, man. If I'm Messi, I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to need David to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. Well, <laughs> we'll see how that goes over. Let's <laughs> see if he does that. Um <laughs> Uh, Montreal's looking pretty good. They're sitting currently in fourth place in the Eastern Conference. Uh, they ended up, uh, unfortunately having a crazy four to three loss against Chicago in the 99th minute. And you got to see the highlight of this. The ball was kicked and they had like gale force winds there and the ball ended up just blowing into the net and it wasn't even going to go in. And then the, the wind just grabbed it and just ended up putting it into the net and they lost the game. It was totally crazy. One of the wildest goals you ever seen. And uh, unfortunately they, they took the loss, but um, they're looking good coming out of the gate. They've got seven points like the white caps do and uh, yeah, having a pretty nice start. Okay. That, that's, that's great. But I wonder if God had like uh, money on the game where he's just yeah, like, it like it. yeah, I'm just going to lose that wind and boom. I win. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it seemed like it, definitely. Um, Toronto uh, sits one uh, at one place behind them in the uh, conference standings. Uh, they also have seven points, but they uh, suffered their first loss with John Herdman as coach 
uh, for, former Canadian national team coach is there. Um, it was weird, though. Uh, they were playing against a terrible New York City FC team that has had no wins all season, hasn't looked good at all, and they uh, had a red card. One of their players sent off, so they were 10 men down almost the entire game, and they still beat Toronto. So uh, Toronto up to their old tricks from last year, maybe. Uh, Herdman looked like he had them coming good out of the gate, but that was a very tough loss against a, a team in New York that's they were just horrible coming out of the gate. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm shocked that uh, Toronto fell to them. Yeah, no, it, it is shocking, and uh, hopefully they can rectify their issues because if there's one thing for sure, they shouldn't have lost to that team. Shouldn't have lost to New York. No, not at all, no. Um, the uh, FA Cup final games were amazing over the weekend. An absolute classic as Manchester United scored the game winner in the final minute of extra time, beat Liverpool 4-3 to three to advance to the semifinals. The other quarterfinals had Chelsea doubling up on Leicester, 4-2. Man City shut out Newcastle, 2-0. And Coventry beat Wolverhampton, the Wolves, 3-2. Uh, all advanced now to the semifinals. It'll be Man City versus Chelsea and Co Coventry against Man United. Uh, those games go on April 20th. And the final will be May 25th for the FA Cup. Um, looking forward to that. Um, okay. We are running out of time, but uh, we have to cover the UFC Fight Night 240, UFC Vegas 88. Uh, we had a, a smaller Apex card coming out, and um, we had the heavyweight battle for the main event uh, Ty Bam Bam to Ivasa against Marcin Tabura. And uh, it, I, I think everybody thought this is going to get over pretty quick. Uh, Bam Bam really tried to end it quick with yes, some serious shots and power. Uh, he had Tabura in a bit of trouble, had him bleeding, ha had nailed him with a few tough shots, a couple elbows. Uh, Tabura was able to withstand that pressure, was able to take the fight to the ground and ended up getting a, uh, a really, really big victory. Uh, pretty damn impressive after, um, you know, weathering that early storm from Bam Bam. If there was one thing to say about March and Tabora is, uh, he's durable. He's tough. Yeah. Like it, it's hard to get him actually out of there. And so did his best, but, uh, two of us is weak on the ground. And especially against uh, a superior grappler like Tabora, once Tabora got into the ground, I was like, "Ah, this 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 could be over." And once Tabora got his back, sunk in that rear naked choke, I'm like, "No, no, okay, so no, now it's definitely over. It, it, it is over." Yeah. I I was impressed with Tuivasa though. Went out on his shield, didn't tap. Yeah. The weird when, thing was when Herb Dean pulled uh, Tabora off, it didn't look like he was unconscious it looked like he was still fine herb had grabbed his arm and yeah. it kind of flopped down Stop so i think herb thought okay he's out but i don't know if he was 100 percent out but he didn't protest a ton no. uh i think he was either you know stunned maybe he was going out but um you know he i he definitely didn't didn't tap and uh yeah it seemed like he was going out so uh, I you know I'll give Herb the benefit of the doubt there. Uh, unfortunately for Tua Vasa, it was his birthday. Uh, he was turning 31 years old and wanted to celebrate, definitely with a shoey or two. And uh, after yeah, got taken down. Uh, he's got to get better on his ground game for sure, and uh, maybe has an opportunity to win a bunch more of these fights. Yeah, his ground game needs work. Um, his takedown defense needs work. Um. If he does these things, then yes, he'll give himself more of an opportunity to win these fights. But uh, great, uh, great job by Tabora uh, yeah. to lock that win. Yeah, very impressive. Uh, number ten beat number nine, so they'll switch positions in the rankings. And uh, Polish, Polish guys, uh, Polish toughness is uh, 
alive and well. Um, great victory. He got 50K for that as one of the performance of the night. And there was a lot of rear naked chokes up throughout this card. Quite yep. a few uh, littered throughout. And uh, very, very, very impressive. Um, before we go forward, I do want to make mention of another heavyweight in the UFC, a legend that uh, is in the hospital right now, recovering. Uh, Mark the Hammer Coleman ended up uh, getting woken up uh, the other day by his dog. Um, his dog had uh, sensed a fire in the house, had come to wake up Coleman. Um, Mark went upstairs and grabbed his mother, uh, got her safely out of the house, went back into the house that was fully engulfed, uh, saved his father, brought him out, went back for the dog, unfortunately was not able to get the dog in time, had to leave the house. Uh, Mark was um, hospitalized for smoke inhalation and um, was unfortunately uh, told the bad news that his, his dog passed away, but he's an absolute hero saving his elderly parents. And um, this is a guy that's one of the first uh, UFC champions, kind of the founder of ground and pound. And uh, one of those, um, you know, UFC legends that uh, deserves a lot of praise from everybody that loves this sport. And, um, you know, another amazingly uh, heroic and selfless act. And um, we sure hope he recovers 100% from the smoke inhalation and, and um, yeah, can get back to uh, his regular life uh, as quick as possible. Absolute legend, obviously a hero, and uh, definitely a speedy recovery to Mark. Uh, it was a touching scene to see his daughters in there and yeah. seeing their dad wake up and open his eyes and stuff. It was <laughs> it was awesome to see. It was yeah. Really awesome. Sure was. Yeah. yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. So all of all our best to Mark and, and his family. And I'm so happy that he was able to save his parents. And uh, yeah, uh, his dog Hammer didn't make it, but he's a hero as well. Uh, was yeah. able to wake Mark up and give him the opportunity to save his save his family yeah yeah like rest in peace hammer like he real the real savior of the day yeah incredible Dude. okay um uh, the co-main event uh it was a master class that was phenomenal to watch until uh it wasn't and all of a sudden we've got a controversy on our hands we've got a no contest that this didn't seem right doesn't sit well with me Definitely doesn't sit well with Brian Battle. Um, he <laughs> was uh, putting on an absolute clinic against Ange Loza. And uh, went, all of a sudden, a, a thumb ended up in the eye in a bit of an exchange. Loza went to the side of the cage. And um, the referee, uh, Mike Beltran, called in the doctor. A little too early, I thought. Uh, the doctor came in started um, trying to help him with a cloth, asking him questions. Um, I th thought that the USC had sort of put some policies in that was going to stop yeah. something like this. And unfortunately, at one point, Loza said, I can't see. And uh, immediately the doctor called, uh, told the referee, that's it. The uh, Beltran called it off and we had a no contest. Uh, much to everybody's dismay and dislike and uh ended up in a bit of a brawl after as well but uh yeah tough way for it to end there tough way but i will say this brian battle looked absolutely fabulous yeah he like loso there there was at no point in time that loso was winning that fight no period Not at all. no point in time yeah battle was piecing him up on the feet his combos were crisp accurate sharp his defense was like on point. Everything about that fight, like it was, that was the best version of Brian Battle we've ever seen. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Um. So after the fight was done, the no contest was said. Some words were exchanged between the two fighters, which almost necessitated them going back to fight. Brian Battle brought up a couple of very valid points. Where was that passion in the fight? 
Yeah. Right? Like yeah. the things that he said, I'm like, oh, well, yeah. kind of hard to a lot of points. To go against that. Yeah. Very hard, right? So yeah. if both, I hope they do it again right. so that Losa can say that, no, I, I'm not afraid of you. Of course, we can do it again because I think Losa is a very good fighter. But I think if they do do it again, Battle's just going to do the same thing to, that he did in this one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't really think I want to see it again because it's it was a one sided affair and uh, you know there was no way Loza's winning that fight and I don't want I, I don't like seeing mismatches like that. Uh, yeah. I mean Loza's super tough, but he, he has nothing again you know nothing to offer against Battle to to win this fight. So I think Battle moves on. I think he gets a, a really good opponent and I really think that he's shown the UFC. Uh, matchmakers and top brass that you can put them in against some really high level competition and have a absolutely phenomenal fight. If they don't do this rematch, he definitely should be fighting somebody in the top 15. Yeah. Like he's shown it. He's shown it. Like, I, I'm worthy of that now. Yeah. I liked it. He was pussy bitch mf -er, <laughs> and yeah. uh, even fought his brother outside uh, War of Words with his brother. And oh, he's yeah. like, I would have killed his brother too. I killed him, and he's an, awesome. he's an MMA guy. His brother, oh man, it would have just been another <laughs> you know, violation of, of him. Yeah. And he's like, you know, yeah, uh, you're right. Um, you know, the passion that he showed after uh, I called him a pussy bitch, but you know, uh, where was that when he, you know, really wanted to get back into the fight? So, um, yeah, hopefully it wasn't a severe. My injury we can never tell unless you're the guy but um yeah it uh seemed like maybe he was looking for a way out and he got it yep he kind of did he kind of did but if he has a severe eye injury then take that away yeah obviously there's a reason why he had to stop fighting yeah um, okay the fight that uh, happened right before this was uh, a battle between 40 year old Ovin St. Pro, OSP, former title challenger, uh, a guy that holds the record for the most ever light heavyweight uh, uh, fights, 25th appearance in the octagon, uh, came in as a severe underdog, plus 490. Kennedy Injechku, the African savage, came in and was a minus 675 favorite. And uh, had a pretty damn good first round. And then OSP took over this fight and was phenomenal. Uh, incredibly durable, tough, very accurate strikes. And uh, just continued to chip away and, uh, and won this fight. Uh, very impressive for the 40-year-old. And uh, great to see him, uh, you know, upset uh, Injechku, who's... Uh, Younger, bigger, faster, uh, had all the advantages, but wasn't able to win this fight. I say that OSP won this fight because they like he managed to get the fight at his pacing. Yeah, he fought at his pace. Right, and and, yeah. and Jekyll never fought at his pace. Yeah. Never put together the combos that we know that he can put together. He fought with with the one shot like OSP was, but that's what OSP wanted him to do. Right, and I, 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 I give credit to OSP because I don't know how he managed to get into Kennedy into his pacing, but he yeah. did. And that's what won him the fight. But that third round, love that third round. That's where they just they said we'll fight in the phone booth and see what happens. Love that it. was fun. Love that it. that last round was fun. Those two are just uh, yeah throwing at each other. Finally, uh, putting together shot after shot after shot. It because it was kind of a a one and done for the early parts of that fight, but uh, they finally, uh, yeah, started putting them together, and it was a, a really fun in the pocket shot for shot. Let's go at it, and it was nice. Um, as I mentioned, uh, those that twenty five fights was the most ever for a light heavyweight fighter. Um, the most wins in light heavyweight history is John Jones with twenty. Glover Teixeira is second with sixteen, and tied. In third place, OSP with 15 wins, and Ryan Bader also 15 wins. And both guys 
OSP and Kennedy and Jetsku both set personal vests for significant strikes in this one. It was a nice stand-up battle. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. It was a lot of fun. Uh, okay, let's talk about the Christian Rodriguez and uh, Isaac Delgerian fight. Uh, tell me about what you thought about this one. I was impressed. Delgerian is one heck of a grappler. Like, his grappling savvy was on point. Yeah. Like it was, I I was I was amazed. I was amazed at his the way that he was able to control and flow with Rodriguez. But the thing that I was even more impressed in Dolgarian's um, his superiority in grappling was the fact that Rodriguez was defending everything. Yeah, he defended everything that was thrown at him, and he was just waiting. He literally. That was his. That was the game plan. We're gonna wait till he tires himself he out. Wears himself out here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, up. and then I'm going to attack, yeah. which is exactly what he did in the third round. That third round was a 10-8 round. Yeah. Utterly dominated him because he was exhausted. He was physically exhausted. That's what won him the fight. I was impressed, man. Yeah. I, I'm very, very impressed. Great yeah, game. it's uh, got to be hard for C Rod to wait that long and mm -hmm. wait until the guy gasses himself out. But um, yeah, he just uh, tried his best to uh, stuff the takedowns, tried his best to immediately get up when he was taken down and just kept waiting and waiting. And then you saw Dolgarian just uh, take a couple of really big gulps of air and then yeah. look like, uh oh, uh, yeah, I, I, I've gassed myself a bit. And then Boom, uh, C-Rod was able to get at him and get a really big dominant 10-8 round in that in that round to pull it out and get the split decision win. I, I thought it was an incredible comeback and very impressive. Uh, he's got a four-fight win streak now, and and um, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing him fight very soon. He's only 26, and um, yeah, you know, really looking good. I like that Rufus Sport. I like, uh, I like that team. And I think, um, yeah, he'll just get better and better, uh, especially, you know, being only 26. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The future is very bright for that young man. Yeah. Um, okay. We had a women's bantamweight fight. Uh, Fanny Kinezad against Macy Chasson. Um, Macy was, um, she's just so big. She's just so tall and, and uh, gets another rear naked choke victory here um she got 50k for that as one of the performances of the night uh this was a rematch that happened back five years or six years earlier in the uh contender series and uh, macy was able to get the win there uh she was able to get the win again and and did so in, in very impressive fashion dominating fashion like uh I didn't see Kianzad win in any position in this fight, uh, especially with the grappling. I was actually very impressed with Chase On's grappling, um, the way that she took the back so quickly. And then I'm like, oh, okay, well, this is this is over. This is over, and it was over. It was yeah. over very quickly. Grant, she sunk in that rear naked choke. Fantastic finish for Chase On. Yeah, I was pretty shocked at seeing their rankings. Of Chase On came yeah. in rank number ten, and. Panny came in uh, ranked number six. Uh, looks like they'll probably switch positions there. And Chase on definitely the much better fighter. And yeah. uh, she mentioned after the fight that she almost retired after losing to Aldana. Uh, came very close to quitting the sport. And um, she's very happy that she's decided not to and uh, keeps moving on. Uh, the fight that kicked off the main card had... Uh, GM3, Gerald Mearshart against another Bam Bam. We have two Bam Bams on the main card. Brian Bam Bam, Barmbarina. Uh, Mearshart, uh, this is a massive veteran. Uh, he's got the most fights in the middleweight division out of any active fighter. Uh, that was his, this was his 53rd fight. And um, yeah, he's just relentless, incredible at takedowns. Uh, gets another of the Rear naked choke victories on this card. Uh, yeah, I, this I, I would hate to fight this guy. He's super tough on the ground. Yeah, man. Like And Barbarina specifically trained to fight him off and ward him off his grappling. Yeah. 
and it didn't matter. And it's like Mir Sharp eventually got it into his realm, into his world, and did what he wanted. The thing about his rear naked choke that was so freaking impressive, he choked him out on his chin. Yeah, yeah. He choked, like I did, like in my head, I'm like, can you do that? Like the amount, like as he said post fight, the amount of pressure that you got to put on a person to choke them out on their chin, but like, yeah. that'd be a lot. And I'm like, what kind of squeeze is that? What are you, a silverback gorilla? How are you doing? Like, I couldn't believe he did that. And you saw Barbarina visibly go. Yeah. I, he was that, out. He was 100% out. sleeping. Yeah. He was right. out. So, yeah. Um, that was his 36th win. And it tied him with the most finishes in the middleweight history with Anderson Silva. So incredible that he's been able to um, be in the game this long. And everyone knows what he wants to do. Uh, but he still is able to pull off and and get another win. And, uh, yeah, good way to kick off that main card. Yeah, great way. Great way. Okay, talk about the feature fight in the prelims. We got Mike Davis against Nathan Levy. Um, a, a, an amazing arm triangle that uh, he was able to sink in. Um, Davis uh, really was able to... Um, Control the grappling, was able to get the spin, sink in that arm triangle, finally get over, uh, get his body into it. And uh, Mike Beltran had to come in and stop it. And Beast Boy with another huge, huge, huge win in the UFC. Yeah, no, his grappling was so fluid, so on point. And he's, and he's got the power to back it up. Like, just look at the man's body. And it's freaking amazing. Yeah. Same with Levy, but Levy was not even close to the grappling savvy that Davis showed. Like he was, was wasn't even close. Yeah. Davis was super calm in there, and it, it was almost like what I think I heard one of the announcers say. It, it just seems like he's doing meditation. I, I he's he's so calm, not nervous, and just yeah. reacting to what was given. Yeah, great win by Davis. Dominating win by Davis. Um, so he's got a, a four fight win streak, uh, third longest in the division behind Islam and Patty Pimblett. Uh, also, Hanato Moikano has four as well. Um, he had quite the break um, from fighting. He hadn't fought since October 22. Really wants to get back at it quickly. He called out Patty Pimblett. He also called out Jim Miller and Clay Guida. Uh, would be great to see him fight. Any any one of those three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he would be up for any one of those three, for sure. Um, okay, we had the uh women's bantamweight fight between Chelsea Chandler and uh Josie Nunez. Um Nunez is always very interesting and strange because she's so short. She's unbelievably small at five foot two. Uh, she's got one of the shortest reaches in the UFC. And uh, she just utilizes the power, comes in, and uh, is able to, uh, yeah, be able to, uh, uh, you know, tr get at it. Uh, Chelsea Chandler ends up um, winning the fight, though, by decision. And um, I was, um, yeah, I was back and forth on this one. I, I kind of was uh, seeing how uh, Chandler was keeping the fight at distance at times, but Noon has had to just keep wading in and, and trying to force the action to this one. Uh, tell me about your thoughts on this one. Okay, so Nunes always had to force the action by just being a hook monster. And that, that's what she does. She just yeah. wades in with hooks. Hooks, hooks, and more hooks. Overhand, uh, yeah. <laughs> or overhand right. And the, actually, the overhand right was actually landing for quite a bit. That was, I believe, her, her punch that was landing. But Chandler was able to handle that. And whenever they got to the grappling, Clearly, she had the advantage because she was by far the bigger woman in that octagon at that point in time. She looked like she was in a different weight category. Yeah. yeah. Like, it was massive. shocking how, how much different. that looked, like how different that was. So, yeah. great win by Chandler. Utilized her reach. Had to hold on a little bit on that third round because she was uh, she was tiring out, but got the first two rounds, got the win.
Got the land. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we got a um, flyweight battle between Jalel Filio against Odie, the Jamaican sensation Osborne. Uh, always been a fan of Osborne's. Love Dewey Cooper in his corner. Uh, he also had Aljamain Sterling there. And um, yeah, I was um, thinking that uh, this would be a, a heck of a battle. Um, but uh, Bilio was able to get uh, another one of those rear naked choke victories on this card. Ended up uh, winning it in late in the first round. Yeah, Bilio showed his uh, superior grappling, jiu-jitsu skills. Once he got Osborne on the ground, didn't let him back up. Got it to the place where he knew he could win the fight. He won the fight there. It's a great win by Filio. He's finished 15 of his 16 opponents, uh, eight in the first round. That was his seventh rear naked choke victory out of his 10 subs. Um, asked for uh fight. Uh, wants to be on the fight card in UFC London. Did get a 50K performance of the night bonus for him. But I hated him holding the Bible and, and Bible bumping and stuff. It kind of ruined that whole uh, end-up victory there for me. Uh, as soon as I saw that, I saw Bryce Mitchell. And since I was watching um, the UFC late, I fast-forwarded it. Because I'm like, I do not want to hear what you have to say. I am good. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah, did not like it. Um. Okay, Danny Silva gets a decision victory over Josh Kulia Kulabau, El Kuma. Uh, great fight. Um, my favorite fight of the night. I think this one. Uh, ended up in a split decision, but um, hell of a great battle. Uh, the entire fight. It. They fought each other at every position at every. Either on the mat, grappling, jujitsu, standing up. Silva's boxing was superb. Kulabal had to actually kind of weather the storm, figure him out a bit, and then he got his strikes off. I uh, it was a great fight. It was an absolute battle. It was a war. I personally believed it was anybody's fight to win. Yeah. Silva, they gave the split decision to, to Silva, but I thought Kulabal could have easily won this fight too. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, we got another 50k performance bonus from this fight between uh Corey McKenna and Jackie Amarine. Um, this was an arm bar uh submission victory by Amarine, and um, yeah, as I said, she gets uh, uh 50k for it. It was the fourth fastest submission in straw weight history, and um, yeah, Hoppins. Uh, was a bit out of her element in this one. Amarim just quickly was able to um, get this going and uh, transitioned a couple times, got the arm bar, ended up getting the tap pretty quick. Um, McKenna made a mistake. Don't go to the ground with a jiu-jitsu specialist no. who's won countless, like, you know, like titles or whatever in jiu-jitsu. Don't do that. Don't do it. She went to the ground and she got eaten up. Now... There was a little bit of a controversy there because the ref jumped yeah, in. Yeah, stopped it at one point. Yeah, Beltron jumped in and said, oh, that's it. And then, oh, and, sorry about oh, that. No, keep it going. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, right? Like, yeah. so, because he thought that McKenna was tapping, and then so he went in there a little too early. Yeah. But Amory was so good that she kept hold of that arm and just turned it into an arm bar. So McKenna was like, oh, she's going to break my arm for them yeah i'm glad i'm glad it didn't change the outcome of this fight and i'm glad that um uh, yeah she hadn't they hadn't stood up and walked away or anything um because it, it sure looked like uh mckenna was doing this and she was yeah. coming close to tapping but then she just held her hand back and he yeah. was already in there yelling stop and then yeah. all of a sudden realized no 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 sorry keep going and luckily yeah as i said it didn't change the outcome yeah, no, it didn't change the outcome, so that was good. Now, now here's another question. I, I was thinking about this. What is it good that he didn't stop the fight? Because he was in the motion of stopping the fight, right? And in my head, I'm like, is he actually allowed to do that? Like, touch the fighters and say, stop? Because 
if you do that, it's the end of the fight. I think yeah. that's technically it's supposed to be the end of the fight. Yeah. But since he said, forget what I said, <laughs> keep fighting. Like yeah. I was just like, yeah, I don't know, but whatever. End of the day, I would rather that happen. Yeah. Right. And the, and the fighters keep going as opposed to it stop. And then it's just like, it's a huge controversy. We don't know who really won and yada, yada, yada. Hopefully it's a learning lesson. He'll have to wait that extra second, extra beat. Um, you, you, you know, you got to be a little concerned when somebody's arm is being, you know, manipulated yes, that badly. And, yes. you know, you, you can, you know, one second can make it snap, uh, yep. tear it, do a lot of damage to it. So, you know, you got to be, as a ref, cognizant of that fact that, you know, I if she taps – it's hurting. Something's going to be, uh, you know, so, but, and that, that hand did come super close to oh, tapping yeah, and it didn't. Good. So, you know, I, I've given him a ton of leeway on this one. I'm really happy that I, I don't know. I, I didn't actually watch it a second time, but did he actually touch both fighters? Did he, did he have hands on them as he it, was doing it? Like it, it looked like at least he touched one. one. Right. And, and so, and I, and but like you said, it was such a close. Like I saw, I, I watched it again, and she did make the motion, and it came close, yeah. but she held off. Because yeah. like, she thought she could fight it off. Yeah. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, you're not fighting that off. Yeah. You're not fighting that off. And then even when he did stop it, there was an interruption, but she still held on to the arm. Yeah. Right? Great. And so I'm, he was still able to win. And, I'm happy. and and I give McKenna credit. She was tough. She tried to fight it off, but I'm like, no, she's eventually going to get that. You, you should tap. Yeah. And then, You're right. She shouldn't have taken it to the ground. That was her mistake. She looked devastated by it, but uh, her, mistake. Her, uh, her mistake there. And, uh, yeah, something that she'll learn from, hopefully. And, uh, yeah, uh, great victory by Amory. Um, I do want to mention the Tiago Moises uh, KO victory. Um, one of only, I think, 10 fights – ended by a late by by leg kicks um he had beaten up um a late replacement uh mitch ramirez came in replaced uh brad riddell on late notice came in and was a game fighter but uh moises had been chopping that calf chopping that leg it was getting swollen it was getting sore it was getting brutal um the the start of the third round uh, you could tell that um, it, it just needed one more shot. That's all it took. He dropped onto his back once that kick was landed. And uh, Mark Smith came in and said, it's done. And he was not going to be able to stand on it anymore. He was a compromised fighter. Moises is super tough. And, you know, good on uh, Ramirez for coming in and being that late replacement. But uh, he's going to have a hard time walking today tomorrow and for a few days that was a brutal a brutal display of of calf kicks and uh, yeah it was it was rough and uh, i feel i feel a bit sorry for him yeah that's always that always sucks when you get brutalized like that leg kick after leg kick after leg kick it, it it's actually probably one of the worst ways to yeah tough yeah it's got to be one of the worst yeah um, okay, I do want to just quickly mention um, next week's card. Uh, we've got another fight night. We've got uh, Thug Rose Namajunas against Amanda Hebus. Um, Rose is coming off two straight losses. Uh, she had a unanimous decision loss to Manon Furio uh, back in September in Paris. That was her flyweight debut fight. And... Um, she was coming off the heels of that candidate for one of the worst title fights ever in the history of the sport uh, mm -hmm. as she lost a split decision to Carla Esparza back in May of 2022. Um, Hebus comes in, the number eight flyweight. Uh, she's coming off a huge KO win, a spinning wheel kick uh, victory over Viana Pinheiro in March... Uh, last year um she has been uh hit and miss though she's alternated wins and losses in her last seven uh she's fought a ton of the tough girls all the top people in the division but 
Um, she needs to string together a couple of wins to start moving herself higher up the rankings. Um, I don't know what I'm going to see here. Don't know. Rose is one of the toughest girls. Uh, before her last two fights, you know, I would have said her for sure. Uh, but I don't know. I think Hebus is bigger, uh, might be faster, might be more powerful. So maybe I'm leaning towards Hebus, but uh, hard to count Rose out. She's had a phenomenal career. I will just give her the benefit of the doubt and throw out those last two fights, though. Yeah, Nami Yunus is incredibly skilled. And if there's one thing I can say for certain, we're not going to see a fight like Esparza because Hebus is going to come after it. Yeah. Going to make a fight. Yeah. So, What's with there? that being said, uh, and Hebas should be on a on on a high note because of how she took that last fight and won that last fight. So, I'm 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 saying I think it's going to be a barber. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great fight between. Could these be, two. yeah, yeah, yeah should be. I really do. I yeah. think it's going to be a fantastic fight. I'm never a big fan of women uh, being the main event, but uh, this could be a heck of a good fight and uh, should be fun. Uh, the co-main event has Carl Williams against uh, Justin Toffa. Uh, Justin is replacing his brother who replaced him <laughs> on his last fight. So they're doing this switch. Um, Toffa is called Bad Man. He's 7-3 and three with um, three KO wins in his last four fights. Um, he had a fight against Austin Lane that ended in an eye poke, no contest. They ran it back, and he KO'd him really quickly and was able to get the win. Um, love seeing Toffa fight. Love seeing all these Toffas fight. And uh, Carl Williams comes in. He's 9-1 and one in his UFC career. 2-0 um, and oh in the UFC, both decision victories. Uh, he beat Chase Sherman and Lucas Brzezki. Um, he got in through the Dana White Contender Series. Um, should be a nice heavyweight battle i don't expect it to go long though i don't expect it to go long either um i'm actually leading towards justin the brother winning this fight yeah. and i think he wins it in the first round i'm gonna call it okay good call um edmund shabazian aj <laughs> dobson shabazian comes in uh 12 and 4 he um He's fighting Dobson, who replaced uh, Dusko Tudorovic. Um, Shabazian's coming off a loss to Anthony Fluffy Hernandez in his last fight in May. He's lost four of his last fight, four of the last five fights, and uh, is really uh, falling very much down the rankings. Uh, you and I, you know, have a problem with his trainer and uh, top corner man, and uh, he was all hyped to me. Did not really deserve the hype and praise that he was getting from the UFC. We'll see how he um, faces a uh, a late replacement uh, opponent in AJ Dobson. This should be his chance to win a fight, but if he loses this fight, he's out. Yeah. I'm saying it right now. If he loses this fight to a late replacement, he's out. He's out. Yeah, he's that's out. probably right. Uh, AJ was supposed to fight Treshawn Gore in February just last month, but it was canceled. Uh, he did win his last fight uh, in August by unanimous decision. Uh, out of his seven wins, he's got two knockouts and three submissions. Uh, his losses just came by way of decision. I'm kind of leaning towards um, the, the fight of the night being Billy Quarantillo against uh, Yusef Zalal. Um, Quarantillo... Uh, was supposed to fight uh, Gabriel Miranda. Mm -hmm. That fight got canceled. Uh, there have been, uh, as I mentioned, yeah, a few fights canceled off this card. But yep. um, I think the Quarantillo Zalal fight uh, is fight of the night for me. Yeah, because I would have said that the Quarantillo Miranda fight could have been fight of the night as well. So yeah. I am going to agree with you on that. Yeah, it's not a super stacked card. Uh, they did have a lot of other fights fall off. Davy Grant was supposed to fight Cody Gibson, fall off. Uh, Stephanie Luciano was supposed to fight Julia Pilastri. That fight was canceled too. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely a lot of prospects, a few yeah, people that you'll know. But um, 
yeah, not not the most stacked card, but uh, we'll still watch it and we'll give you a breakdown next week. Um, I do want to mention UFC 300 is coming and I can't wait for it. Um, they also announced the uh, big fight, uh, big flyweight championship fight for USC 301 in Rio. Uh, Alexander Pantoja will uh, defend his belt against who? Do you know who? No, I don't. Who? Could it be? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list off these guys and tell me who you think it's going to be. Uh, number one is Roy Val. Number two is Moreno. Number three is Al Bazi. Number four is Kai Kara France. And number five is Mateus Nicolau. Al Bazi. No. Nicolau? No. What? Moreno? <laughs> it's not him either. Uh, uh, number six is Manel Cape. Number seven is Mohamed Mokayev. Number eight is Alex Perez. Number nine is Tim Elliott. Number 10 is Steve Ursig, and number 11 is Matt Schnell. Who do you think it's out of those guys? Oh, so you set me up. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like how you did that. Perez. I don't know. I wish. Uh, I don't know. Number 10, Steve Ursig. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, how, how bizarre. I don't understand. I don't what? get it. He's uh, he's only oh, had – uh, Astro Boy's only had three of the UFC fights – um, he comes in and he gets a shot, title shot at number 10. How weird is that? What are we doing here? Like, are you serious? Like, yeah. that doesn't, I'm sorry, man. Like, if I'm, if I'm anybody above first sake, I'd be like, okay, so I guess rankings don't matter. Yeah. What are we doing? Like, what's our, uh, I'm, I'm shocked by it. I don't understand it. Uh, massive outcry online when this got announced. Massive outcry. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Ursig might not make it. Uh, one of these other top nine guys ahead of him might just take him out. Uh, oh, yeah. It's uh, it's crazy. I haven't even, I, I don't even understand it. It's weird. Uh, it's not been called the main <laughs> event. Don't know what is the main event of uh, 301 so far, but uh, you got the champ against number 10 and you got all these killers, uh, you know, ahead of him. It seems it's just crazy and bizarre. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like it just that doesn't make any. Has that ever actually happened before? Where they just go, you know what? Throw the number twelve guy out there. You get the it shot. Re it reminds me of Sean Strickland against uh, Izzy. <laughs> like, I yeah, a little yeah, bit. But at least Strickland was in the top five, right? Was he? Like, like, maybe. He yeah, like, like yeah. but like don't eat. Top ten, like number ten. Imagine if ten wins and he's got the belt after this. Like, flukes out with a kick and knocks the guy out. Like, geez, insane, super dumb. Oh, yeah. uh, another fighter that's on the three hundred one card <laughs> is the King of Rio, coming out of retirement. Jose Aldo. Uh, oh. He's he's been in the boxing world for the last year and a half. Has fought three three boxing fights. Uh, was uh was called it a quits at USC 278 in August 2022, and he's back at age 37. He's fighting a tough opponent in Jonathan Martinez, and um yeah, I don't know. I think in a way it might be a way to get out of his contract fully. It might be the last fight on his contract, and it might be a way to just be um yeah just not having Done. any more commitments. I yeah. don't know. And I don't, I don't get why they're giving him such a tough opponent when he hasn't fought for so long, but the King of Rio is going to be back in Rio. And this likely will be his last MMA fight. Okay. And it's probably to fight out his contract for sure, because you know how the UFC is. It's like, we just don't tear up contracts. You still got fights on. We yeah. still own you. Cause yeah. that's what we do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and and I don't know. It's Jose Aldo, so I don't know if I'd give him such a hard fight personally myself. But again, the UFC is just like, well, you left us, so now you get a hard fight. Yeah, fun, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm not surprised that they're doing any of this. But also, too, it's Jose Aldo. Much respect to Jose. He's probably not going to be like, oh, you know, maybe I should take somebody else. Like he's a fighter, and yeah. he's got pride. So. I don't know. 
He's a uh, former champion, Hall of Famer, uh, phenomenal MMA career, 31 and 8 in MMA, 13 and 7 in USC, and, uh, you know, was a, had a long, long reign. And uh, great to see him back uh, fighting Martinez, though, five wins in a row, and, you know, one of those really, really tough guys. But, um, yeah, let's hope um, Aldo has a good performance for his last ever fight, probably. Uh, another former champion had some terrible news. Uh, delivered to him, Peter Yan has to undergo surgery tomorrow. Uh, he tore his ACL, has severe meniscus damage, and a terrible groin injury suffered in his last fight and has to mm -hmm. undergo surgery. Will probably be likely lost for at least a year now. Yep, absolutely. I, You would never have been able to tell no. both fight. That dude is tough. Amazing. Considering yeah. that he suffered all of those injuries and you couldn't tell I know. one bit, one iota. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He's they, these guys just blow us away all the time at their toughness. And yeah, uh, awesome. Last last thing I want to mention is uh the uh mm -hmm. Nate Diaz Jorge Masvidal 2. They're gonna uh do it in boxing um June the first at the Forum in Inglewood, California. Um, what do you think of this one? Uh, well, first off, I hope that Nate Diaz actually trains and he's actually in shape. I know Jorge will be. Yeah. Because Jorge will be looking to knock him out. So, Nate, do yourself on a good fight. Jorge is going to just embarrass you. Yeah. Good. Their last fight was... Uh, in August, um, no, sorry, that was Diaz's last fight. Their, their last fight uh, a couple years ago, um, Jorge ended up winning it because of a Diaz cut uh, above his eye. Doctor came in and stopped it. Um, Diaz's last fight was in August, a unanimous decision loss to Jake Paul, who fights Mike Tyson next. Jorge retired after a loss in April 2023, and he'll come out of retirement for this. This will be uh, a light heavyweight boxing fight at 175, 10 rounds. And um, Gamebred has been busy with his MMA promotion and his bare knuckle fighting. Um, they recently just had a heavyweight title fight for the Gamebred promotion. Two former USC vets uh, fought in it. Junior Dos Santos beat... Um, Alan Belcher to win. That was earlier um, this month. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see them come together. Uh, they were the uh, original BMF guys that uh, fought for that BMF title. And um, yeah, they're both, they're both huge, very beloved, especially near the end of their careers. Uh, I think it'll uh, move the needle. It'll get a lot of people watching and, uh, Let's hope it's a very competitive, fun fight. They both come in a, a tip-top shape, and uh, we get to see something great. Yeah, hopefully it's a spirited fight. Hopefully they both, both come in shape, and uh, we, we get our money's worth. We yeah. get our money's worth. Let's hope, yeah. Okay, that's it, man. Uh, we covered it all again, as always, and uh, had a blast doing so. Thanks so much for your time and expertise, and uh, I had fun. I hope you did, too. Always do, my friend. Always do. Nice. Okay, man. Well, uh, have a great week ahead. And um, yeah, we will talk soon. We'll talk soon. All right. We'll take it okay. easy. All right. You too. Bye for now. Okay, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for uh, watching again, as always. Appreciate your support. Uh, speaking of uh, support, I uh, want to thank our partners and sponsors. Verbero, the hockey equipment and apparel company, an industry leader in technology, performance and value, and the V350 stick is a must-have for anyone in your midst. I want to thank Anchor.fm, the easiest place to make a podcast. Just go to Anchor and you will be able to do what Jason and I did here. Uh, Pampas and Possibilities, they are designers of West Coast pretty things for your home. Spruce it up, make it look great. I uh, highly recommend them. And Forever Living, the aloe vera company for health and beauty products. Uh, we love them. You'll love them. Uh, get them on our website at discounted rates, and you'll be glad you did. 
uh, yeah, thanks for your support. Thanks, uh, people. Uh, I love the subscribers moving up all the time and the views. Uh, it's been great. Thanks for all your questions and comments and um, love you guys lots. Have a fantastic week ahead. Enjoy the sports and we'll talk soon. Take care. Bye for now.